assume the case for the proposition, it falls upon me to introduce Chief Royal Correspondent at Newsweek, Jack Foyster. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and it is a huge pleasure to be here today to speak to you outside the usual confines of my role as a correspondent, to come to this historic place steeped in tradition and ceremony where you debate how to forge a brave new future for Britain. Who could better understand the contradiction of 21st century monarchy, which must forever be looking backwards and forwards at the same time? <clears throat> <clears throat> at one moment, William or Harry are to be found saving the world one hug at a time. At the next, this month, a future king outlined the government agenda on the cost of living crisis while sitting in a gold throne, chaperoned by a crown he's not yet allowed to wear, which was driven to the state opening of Parliament in its own car. I'm here to tell you that this state institution, this pillar of society, this constitutionally enshrined entity is, in fact, mere celebrity. A difficult task, you might think, given centuries of history and tradition, which we have heard much about so far today. Uh, I'm not here to tell you about magazine covers or picture spreads or social media tribalism. You know about all that already. The first point to make is that celebrity may, in fact, not be quite so mere after all as celebrities can shine a light on a path that society can choose to go down in the hope of forging a better future. <clears throat> the royals are, in fact, nationalized celebrity. They are state-owned celebrities, free from the burden of profit. It may sound like I've been mocking the royals, but I'm genuinely not. It's good to see them open up when they do. To see William throw his arms around a man in Glasgow recently who was overcome at meeting a future king. To see princes and princesses bear their souls. To see them open up. <clears throat> to meet ordinary people eye to eye. Their role is to set a good example. To give their time to charity so that others give money. To give their emotions, their grief in the cases of William and Harry so that others can see that opening up is good for your mental health. For the Queen to sacrifice during COVID at her husband's funeral, so that others can see that their sacrifices were not made alone. For Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, to be brave enough to discuss racism and suicide, knowing the criticism that she would receive. This is all what celebrities do. They may not do it quite so well, they may not have gold-plated carriages rejected, the platform or the historic moments that lend grandeur, but this is the real practice of celebrity. The Queen moved some to tears with her special coronavirus broadcast at the start of the pandemic when she said, we will be with our friends again, we will be with our families again, we will meet again. But why was it so moving? The reason it was so moving was that the Queen used her life story. She referenced her own experiences during the war. She referenced the, sp the special radio broadcast she gave for evacuee children. And no other royal could have given that speech and had the same impact, because it was about her life, herself as a person, as a human. When the Queen stripped Harry and Meghan of their honorary titles and patronages because they had turned their backs on a life of service, they retorted minutes later that service is universal. That schism is the precise question that we discuss here tonight. Is service universal? Or is it the preserve of an elite with the power to imbue their ordinary work, not so different to the volunteering of other celebrities, with the fairy dust of history? I often wonder what the public truly expect the royal family to deliver each year. And it often strikes me that the biggest stumbling block to abolishing the monarchy is the failure of Republican campaigners to clarify what more a ceremonial head of state might give if chosen by the people. The royals have in recent weeks made this case quite strongly. The queen did not read the queen's speech and may not read it again. As she experiences episodic mobility problems, yet she is still queen. We have not declared a regency, yet would the world be so different if we had? 
What in all honesty would change? Nothing. The world would be exactly as it was before. However, at times the world must and does expect more from the royals than celebrity can provide. As was self-evident during a disastrous recent tour by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge to the Caribbean. William and Kate conducted the visit as though they were celebrities, in fact, as though they were on holiday. They visited Bob Marley's house, for example, and posed next to a life-size cardboard cutout of Bob Marley. All the while, the Caribbean and the world waited with bated breath for an apology for slavery that had been demanded by protesters. Journalists criticized them. Jamaica's prime minister vowed to remove the queen as head of state. The couple themselves seemed more comfortable when they were swimming with sharks in Belize than when talking about Britain's colonial past. In short, when the demands extended beyond the realms of philanthropy which is practiced by celebrities the world over, the future king seemed completely unprepared. But some in the media insisted the tour was a roaring success. Why? Because there were crowds who clapped and cheered, just like you might for a celebrity. But to be royal, you must do more than lift spirits. The public have to want them to reign. Jamaica and Belize indicated that they would end the reign of the Queen insofar as it related to their country. The fact that experienced, capable, intelligent journalists maintained that situation was a success rather than a catastrophic failure shows just how low expectations have become. A few cheers is all that was hoped for when cheers are dished out to celebrities all over the world. The monarchy is not reduced to the status of, the ce of celebrity because of any anything the monarchy has done wrong. The monarchy has been reduced to the status of celebrity because that is the only prism we choose to view them through. And any time we as journalists attempt to hold them to a higher standard, we, ladies and gentlemen, are accused of trying to tear them down. But it doesn't. It doesn't tear them down. It lifts them up to hold them to a higher bar. The fact journalists who do this are seen as disruptors speaks volumes to the exact argument that I'm putting forward. If we believe that they are more than celebrities, then it is up to us to hold them to a higher standard, to expect accountability of the kind that would see Prince Andrew exercised from the line of succession of the kind that would enable, would enable the public to find out whether our head of state contributed money to buy the silence of his accuser, Virginia Jeffrey, a Jeffrey Epstein victim. Just this weekend, it was confirmed that Prince Andrew, who we were told as recently as January had withdrawn from public life, will in fact be on show in June in public as a celebrated knight of the Order of the Garter. How can this be right? The man's lawyers sought a ruling that the New York Child Victims Act should be considered unconstitutional. That legislation helped literally thousands of abuse victims seek justice. Now we hear he plans to attend a service of thanksgiving in the Queen's honor, overshadowing the Platinum Jubilee, just like he overshadowed a memorial to Prince Philip. Celebrities are free to lay waste to their own reputations, and the supply and demand of the markets in their own industries will take care of the question of accountability. How can we say the royals are more than celebrity if we will not hold the likes of Prince Andrew to even this meager standard? Still entitled to call himself a prince, the Duke of York, to parade around as an honorable knight. It doesn't have to be this way, of course. We can decide as a public, and you can decide as the future leaders of this country, that our expectations of the royal family extend beyond weddings and babies and street parties. The first step, though, is to admit that you have a problem. And everybody in this room can do just that tonight by voting in favor of this motion, which I recommend to you all.